So this morning I'd like to continue speaking with you on the teaching series that we're going through called Unlove. And I'd like to talk with you about the subject, Unlove Ourselves. It's almost the opposite of what you'll hear the world tell you. The world will tell you you need to love yourself more. But we're going to be talking from a different angle. Jesus would teach us to learn to be selfless. To learn to be less selfish. Jesus often would say things like, If you want to be the greatest, you must become the least. If you want to save your life, you must lose your life in order to save it. It, it, the, the greatest among you will become the greatest servant or slave of all. And Jesus' teaching would often go to a place where he's trying to get us to love others more, love God more, and love ourselves less. But so often what we find is we tend to be a very selfish people. But we tend to think selfishly and do selfish things, and sometimes the most selfish things can end up being some of the most ridiculous things and, and leave us with some of the most ridiculous stories. I came across a story about one man who was, he was sent to prison for 20 years in the 60s for bank robbery. He decided he would try it again when he got out in 2003. He went to a county in Virginia and decided to try to rob a bank again. He had a gun with him in his pocket that, that he didn't pull out all the way. He walked up to two tellers, told them to give him as much cash as they could. They gave him loads of cash, and he ended up leaving a trail of bills as he was trying to stuff those bills into his pockets while he was running to get away. When he had run to where he had left his getaway car, he realized he had left the keys in the car and locked it. So he had a locked getaway car. He looked around, found a piece of wood, and began banging on one of the windows to get into his getaway car. Two passerbys saw him. Then they yelled at him, began running towards him, and he decided to pull that gun out and shoot somebody. So in pulling the, the gun out, in the process of that, he shot himself in the leg. And when he shot himself in the leg, one of the passerbyers thought he was shooting at them, pulled out his gun and shot the man in the leg again. And the whole story ended up with this fellow being arrested again, charged with eight felonies, two of which were... Uh, attempted manslaughter, attempted murder, sorry. And so sometimes our selfishness can go to a point that looks ridiculous. It can go to a serious place and really hurt us in life. Other times our selfishness can come in a little more subtle ways. One phone company did a research study on all the words being used across their lines for a while. And they found that the most common word used in telephone conversations was the word I. There was another study done to figure out what is the sweetest sound in any language. And one of the most common things they found was that the sweetest sound to most people was the sound of their own name. One company did a study on how to help people not get so upset and angry as they waited for the elevator. So what they decided to do was put reflective metals and they decided to put mirrors up around the elevators and in the elevators what they found is people complained less as they were able to look at themselves more. Sometimes selfishness shows itself in subtle ways. Author uh, Chuck Swindoll tells a story about a time where it was just sort of an innocent moment, but it was a moment where he realized he was teaching his son selfishness. He had decided to go on a trip with his church to the, to the uh, what river was it? The one in Oregon, the one that's... Boy, oh boy, I can't come up the Rogue River, that's it. He, he decided to go down the Rogue River, and, and he and some guys from his church line brought his son. He was standing there getting instructions on how they were going to do this thing as they went down the Rogue River, and, and he said he noticed some of the boats looked older and beat up, and some of the boats looked newer. So he, he nudged his son and said, let's go over this way. They went over to where they were standing by the newer boats. They had the opportunity to go on the newest boat, and and in the process of talking to all the guides that were going, he looked for the smartest, what looked like maybe the most seasoned guide, and they got the best guide and the best boat, and he realized, in a subtle way, he was teaching his son how to be selfish. And as Jesus tells us, the first will be last, the, 
the greatest will be the least and the servant of all. As Jesus tells us, if you want to save your life, you must lose it. There seems to be a, a, a desire in God to teach us to unlove ourselves. To teach us and to push us, to challenge us, to get to a place where we maybe think of ourselves a little less and others more. Where we think of ourselves a little less and we think of God more. Sometimes our selfishness will show itself in big ways. Sometimes it will show itself in subtle ways. Maybe it's in the way that you control the remote at home. <laughs> Maybe it's in the way that you're stubborn until you get your way. Maybe it's in the way that you talk to other people. Maybe it's in the way that you look to get the best spot in line. Well, a few weeks ago, or a couple weeks ago, at the, on Friday at PBS, I teach the stories to the kids. I go out there to, we put a tent up out there. I put a little fire, a campfire every day. And on the last day, I like to give the kids s'mores. And so the adults will make the s'mores. I try to line kids up and put them in line. And that way it gets a little less chaotic. And they come and they get, each one of them gets a s'mores. And I notice something when you ask them to line up. There's all this nudging that goes on. There's people creeping in to get their spot in line. And every once in a while, I noticed a kid that would walk right to the middle of the line and just put their nose in. And they would just do this, kind of work their way in and, and get their spot. And, and it's almost silly watching. You're like, you're going to get it, man. If you're, getting, you're in line. It's going to happen. You're still going to get it no matter where you are in line. And what I've noticed is that behavior doesn't go away the older we get. We have other ways of merging in the traffic. We have other ways of getting where we want to go, when we want to go, how we want to go, and, and we don't think about how we cut others off. We don't think about who we're stepping on as we get what we want because it's what we want and we're selfishly serving ourselves. and yet we're going to come to a place where God is going to tell us, begin to unlove Yourself. I'd like to turn with you, if you will, open your Bibles up. We're going to be in this little book towards the end of the Bible called Philippians. We're going to start in Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to see in Philippians chapter 2, it was, Jesus wants us to know this truth. And so Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't be selfish and don't be vain. <laughs> don't be... Do, do things. Don't live life in a selfish way. In Philippians 2, 3, in, in the NIV, it says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. I really like the way the message puts it. The message sometimes, the message Bible sometimes puts stuff in a, in, in a way that we can visualize it a little more. And it says it this way, Do not push your way to the front, do not sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. And so what I want to do this morning is I'm going to look at some passages of Scripture that will talk to us about unloving ourselves and what that looks like and what it looks like to love God and love others more. And I want to talk about three practices that we can put to work in our life that will help us apply this principle of unloving ourselves. If you have your note sheets and your programs, each one of you has that, pull it out. You were given a pen so you can take your notes. And, and so I encourage you to pull it out on the back of that. You'll have places to write these principles in. And the first one is this. The principle number one is to have humility rather than conceit. To have humility rather than conceit. This is one of those, it's a lot easier to say than do type things. You see, the problem with selfishness and conceit is that usually those who have it don't know they have it. Usually when we have it, we don't know we're having it, and, and we don't know we're doing it. And not too many of us would walk around and say, you know, I am the most vain, and I am the most conceited, and I am the most selfish person you know. How many of you would say that? Most of us wouldn't describe ourselves that way. Most of us would give ourselves more credit and humility than probably we deserve. 
But most of us would give ourselves more credit in being gracious and giving and, and more credit than we deserve. And what we do is we give our... Well, if, if we were to think about ourselves and be really honest, most of us would say, you know what? I think my opinions are more correct than other people's opinions. You know, I think the thoughts I have are better thoughts than everybody else's. You know, I, I think my agendas are more important than anyone else's. You know, I think my beliefs are more valid than anyone else's. And I live my life better than other people. You know, I think my decisions and my actions are more justifiable and reasonable than other people's. And if we were going to be honest, that's really the way we look at life, isn't it? And Paul is going to say to us, it's time to change that. It's time to unlove yourself. Because if you feel that way, if you think that way, then you've maybe elevated yourself to a place that's a little higher than it should be. And the trouble with selfishness is we often don't see that we have it. It's one of those things that we almost need other people to tell us we have it. How many of you have ever said to someone else, you know, you are really selfish. You are being selfish. And we wish they would hear it because they're being selfish. Well, what I want to do is I want to help you. I want to help you with your spouse so that they can think about it for a minute. I want to help you with yourself so you can think about it a minute. I did what any good researcher would do, and I went on Google. <laughs> I Googled the question. What are some questions that people could ask themselves to find out if they're selfish? And you, you got all kinds of lists, you know, there's like how to know, 10 ways to know you're dating a selfish person, and, and there's all kinds of garbage out there, but I sort of weeded through them, and I found questions that I thought maybe would help us. So I just want to ask you a few questions. You can write some of these down off to the side if it would help you think about it, but, but here are some little clues, some, some little just little things that might help you think that, oh, maybe I struggle with selfishness and vain conceit. The first one is this. Now, now, any one of these probably isn't proof you're selfish, but every one of these, if you added them up, then maybe you got an issue. But the first one is this. Do you have strife with people in your life? Do you struggle with person, personality conflicts? Do you struggle? Are you at strife with somebody right now who, who you don't maybe think of as an enemy, but maybe they're like a friend of me or, or wherever you're at with that, you know? But you strive, you have strife with people in your life constantly. Well, here's the next one. Do I find myself frequently getting into arguments and fights with other people? Maybe it's family. Maybe it's those frenemies. <laughs> It goes back to the first one. But are you constantly getting in arguments and fights with people? Do I routinely accuse other people of selfishness? If you're always accusing people of selfishness, maybe it's coming from a place where you're trying to get them to do what you want, and they're selfish, and they don't do what you want, and, and maybe that comes from a place of selfishness. But do you always ask people for favors? And then maybe never do them when they ask you? Are you the kind of person who people are always wrong? Are you someone who says, people are always wronging me. Whenever you're talking to someone, you're telling them about how someone wronged you here, or someone wronged you there, and, and this is where you were wronged, and that's where you were wronged, and this is how you were wronged. And do you think you deserve special treatment? When everybody else is sitting, you have to be standing. When, when everybody else is following the rules and getting in line, you're nudging in in a different way trying to avoid everything else. Maybe that's coming from a place of selfishness. Do I need to get even with people? Do you, do you find yourself in a place where you just have to get even? Am I unwilling to share or give what is mine? Do people tell me you're being selfish? Am I the rightest person I know? If you're the rightest person you know, 
you may struggle with selfishness. Am I the most spiritual person I know? If you just think if everyone was like you in the church, it would be the best place ever, then maybe you struggle. Have I decided that making peace with people isn't worth it? Do I complain about things that aren't to my liking constantly? Am I finding myself mostly talking about myself when I'm talking with other people? When I'm talking with other people, it's my favorite subject, me. Do I serve others anywhere? And you know what? To be honest with you, when I ask those questions, I feel like I'm like, ooh, oh, oh, because because I know I'm a very selfish person with a very deep seated propensity towards being selfish. And Jesus' words are speaking to me. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble and think of others as better than yourself. Paul, as he wrote to the church in Philippi, even told the people in the church that pastors and church leaders were going to struggle with this. He starts out in the first chapter saying, listen, there are people that are going to preach Christ out of selfishness. He says those others don't have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition and they're not sincere at all. And so if they can make the mistake, maybe that means we can make the mistake, and maybe that means we all might struggle in this area. And so he says to us, make sure you live life from a place of humility and not a place of conceit, not a place of selfishness. And he describes to us what that looks like. It looks like putting the needs of others ahead of our own. It looks like considering others before you consider yourself. It looks like serving God rather than serving myself. It looks like serving others rather than serving myself. Sometimes it looks like realizing you're not as important as you think you are. One of my favorite illustrations, you probably get sick of hearing me tell about it, but uh, one time, one time John Maxwell was teaching a group of leaders about leadership and CEOs and important people in companies, and, and he says, sometimes I have to remind them that they're not as important as they think they are. So, I, so he uses the illustration of a five-gallon bucket filled with water, and he said, what I want you to do is reach your hand down into that five-gallon bucket to your elbow, and then pull it out. And the hole that you left in that bucket is the hole you'll leave behind when you're gone. <laughs> Life goes on. The water fills back in. You won't be missed as much as you think you will. And, and sometimes it takes just realizing in humility that you're not all that you think you are. And sometimes it means being willing to make a sacrifice for other people. Sacrifice myself for the sake of others came across a story of Princess Alice. She was the daughter of Prince Queen Victoria in England. Princess Alice was at a tough time in her life. She had five kids who had diphtheria. Diphtheria is one of those things we don't deal with very often because it's sort of been, uh, it's sort of been gotten rid of through immunizations. But diphtheria is one of those bacteria that lives in the throat and in the mouth, and it's very, very contagious. It's one of those things where if somebody breathes or coughs or sneezes on you, you will get this bacteria that will come into you, make it hard for you to breathe. It will, it will ruin your heart. It will poison your blood. It can affect your nerves, and usually it would lead to death. And so, so Princess Alice was told that she couldn't get too close to her kids. She was told that she probably shouldn't get face to face with them. She probably shouldn't kiss them or, or get too close and hugging them. And can you imagine five children struggling and suffering? And, and Princess Alice said no. When her four-year-old came to her and said, Mom, I'm scared. Her dying four-year-old said, Mom, I'm scared. Will you kiss me? Well, she knew what that kiss was going to cost. And she gave her the fatal kiss. After her four-year-old died, 30 days later, just about, Princess Alice died too from diphtheria. 
And sometimes being willing to say, you know what, I'm going to give up of myself, sacrifice of myself to help someone else. I'm going to give up of myself to sacrifice of myself to honor God and to, to get out of myself in order to help someone else. That's where God wants us to be. Now, it might not be for you giving a failed kiss to a dying child, but maybe for you, it would be letting someone else get credit. Maybe for you, it would be letting someone else take the promotion. Maybe for you, it would mean lifting someone else up, blessing others, seeing their life as more important than your own. Whatever it looks like for you, I encourage you to start putting this to practice. The next one, number two, practice number two is this. This will be the thing that will make the difference between those who live life without God and those who live life because of Christ in their life. There are a lot of people who learn to be unselfish who don't follow Jesus, but the next two will be about following Christ. The next one is this, to learn to put sacred things and pursue sacred things rather than earthly things. Because that's part of being humble before God. Pursuing the sacred things rather than the earthly things. So often we get into life and we want to pursue the earthly things. And pursuing the earthly things is where our selfishness really shines. It, it really shows through. Paul, as he was teaching this young man named Timothy to be a preacher, he would tell him there would be people who are going to come into your church and they're going to have a facade. They're going to look like they love Jesus. They're going to say they love Jesus, but they deny the power of Christ in their life. And here's what they're going to look like. If you have your Bibles, open them up to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2-5. to he says this, these people will be lovers of themselves. So you see why we're saying we need to unlove ourselves. These people will be lovers of themselves. So how do they do that? Here's how they do that. They're lovers of money. They're boastful. They're proud. They're abusive. Can't think of a more selfish way to be in your family. They're disobedient to their parents. Oh, my kids heard that. <laughs> they're ungrateful. They're unholy. They're without love. They're unforgiving. Slanderous. Without self-control. They're brutal. They're not lovers of good. They're treacherous, rash, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. They pretend but they deny his power. And he tells Timothy, have nothing to do with these folks. On one side, these folks are showing what true selfish living for earthly things is. They're going to bite, scratch. They're going to talk bad about people to build themselves up. They're going to pursue their own gain. They're all about their money. And then on the other side, he says, here's the things they rejected. If we want to do the opposite of what they're doing, maybe we reject the things they take a hold of, and we take a hold of the things they rejected. I don't know if you notice in the passage, it says they rejected holiness. We live in a culture where almost nothing is sacred. But we live in a culture that does not pursue holiness, and we ought to be a people who are saying, you know what, I'm going to pursue holy living. I'm going to try to accomplish living a holy life. I'm going to start weeding out the sin in my life and I'm going to live a holy life. And they rejected what is good. They took a hold of what was evil. It's more, it, well, it's, it's more fun to laugh at. It's more fun to watch on TV. It's more entertaining to get into the evil of this world. But, but he says, love what is good. Love the good things of God rather than the wicked things of this world. And he says they have rejected the love of God. They've rejected godliness. If we want to do the opposite, we would pursue godliness. 
What does it look like to live the life that God would approve? What does it look like to pursue heaven rather than the earthly things that we have to gain here in this world just for a moment that, that goes away? Instead, pursue the things that last for eternity. What would that look like in your life if you did that? Jesus one time would tell us the difference is serious. He told a story about a man named Lazarus and a rich man. And the story wasn't to create a rift between poor people and rich people. The story was to illustrate the difference between those who seek God and seek the things of heaven and those who seek the pleasures of earth. He tells that story in Luke chapter 16. He says, there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. Now just for the visual, he says, as Lazarus lay there longing for scraps, the rich man's, at the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit at Abraham, or beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, probably in a nice fancy tomb, and he went to the place of the dead. There, in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. He had lived for the pleasures of this earth. He had lived selfishly, indulging in this world. And Lazarus lived for God. So now he's here being comforted and you are in anguish. And beside, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over from, uh, to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. The rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home where I have five brothers and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in the place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. In other words, they had the Bible and they didn't listen. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sin and turn to God. And then Abraham said, if they won't listen to the Bible, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And I have a feeling what Jesus was sort of hinting at there is, listen, I'm going to come back from the dead and they're still going to reject me. I'm going to come back from the dead and they still won't listen to me. I'm going to come back from the dead and there's still going to be people who play Christian and pretend. I'm going to come back from the dead. People are still going to pursue the earthly things rather than the sacred things. And so what he's challenging us to do is learn to unlove ourselves. And part of learning to unlove ourselves is saying, I'm going to pursue God instead of the things that make me happy, the things that I enjoy, the things that that, that would make me feel better, the things that money can buy, the things that, and you make the list of all the things, which aren't necessarily bad things, but they're all the things that we tend to put first before him. And, and we ask the question, which one do we relate to more? Do we relate to Lazarus? Who was willing to let go of everything in order to take a hold of the one thing that mattered? Or, or do we relate to the rich man who let everything else get in the way? And by the way, just a little clue, you don't have to be rich to relate to the rich man. 
You just have to relate to the kind of person who lets everything else get in the way. And that brings us to practice number two. Practice, or practice number three. Practice number three is this. To live for truth rather than yourself. We get to a place where we say, I'm not only going to live for the sacred, but I'm going to live for what is true. Paul talks about those who love him themselves in Romans chapter 2. He talks about how one day God is going to come and judge, and he literally says, those who love themselves, God will bring into a place of judgment. Here's what he says in Romans 2, verse 8. But he, God, will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth, and instead live lives of wickedness. So those who live for themselves, he says those are the kind of people that are going to find themselves opposing me one day. Instead of living by the truth of God, selfish people live by their own truth. Selfish people refuse to obey God. God gets two great commandments. Love people and love Him with all you have, and we refuse to do it. He tells us to put others first, and we refuse to do it and serve ourselves. He teaches us the truth of sin and the danger of sin, and we refuse to repent of it. We keep it in our life. He teaches us to put Him first, to trust in Him, to tithe to Him, and we refuse to do it. We give Him our breadcrumbs and we build our own kingdoms, homes, buy toys, and go into debt. He teaches us to love and to serve and to accomplish the work of the church, and we refuse to obey and we selfishly follow our own truth. He teaches us to put Jesus first for salvation and we refuse. Instead, we make Jesus a hobby at best and an afterthought at worst. And he says, no, people who live for the truth, put him first. In James 3.16, he says this, wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder and evil of every kind. I don't know about you, but when I look at my world that I live in, I see disorder in you. I see a world filled with selfishness, a world filled where, where people are against one another and where there's hurt and where there's bad things happening. And, and I think we live in a world where jealousy and selfish ambition reign. And the answer is to start living for the truth of God. To start living by the truths of the Word of God. To start living in the truth of Jesus, who is the Word of God in the flesh, who says to us, believe in me, follow me, and walk with me. And if we were going to do that, we would learn to unlove ourselves. And I think the reason God wants us to learn this lesson is because it's at the heart of who He is. God doesn't come to us as a selfish God saying, learn to unlove yourself. The whole story of the gospel is a story of a God who looked at us and said, I'm going to stoop down and become their servants. The God of the universe became your slave, your servant, your sacrifice to help you wipe away your sin. The story of the gospel tells us of how God himself stepped down onto earth and, and took the form of a man, went to a cross, bled and died. He bled so that you could be forgiven. He's a self-sacrificing, servant-hearted God who comes to us and says, I want you to learn to unlove yourself because that's the way I am. I want to finish up with a story this morning. It comes out of Ontario, Canada. You may have heard the story before. It's the story of George and Vera Brzezinski. And George and Vera, their lives were changed forever on February 16, 1989. It was a very normal Thursday morning. The phone rang, 9.15 a.m. There's been an accident. It involved your son. 
As they approached the intersection of Adeline and Simcoe Streets near the high school, they could see lights flashing and police cars and ambulance units. Vera noticed the photographer and she followed the direction of the camera lens to the biggest pool of blood she'd ever seen. All she could say to her husband was, George, Ben went home to be with his heavenly father. Her first reaction was she wanted to jump out of her car and somehow collect all that blood up off the street. That blood for me, she said, at that moment because became the most precious thing in the world because it was life. It was the life-giving blood, and it belonged to my son, the one I loved so much. The road was dirty, and it was no place for that blood. It didn't belong there. George noticed the cars that were driving through the intersection, right through the blood, and his heart was smitten. He wanted to cover that blood with his coat and cry, You won't drive over the blood of my son. Then Vera understood for the first time in her life. One of God's greatest and most beautiful truths that he asks us to live by in humility. Because in the strongest language God could have used, it was the most precious thing that he could give for us. It was the most precious and highest price he could pay for us. And we come here this morning and we're reminded to unlove ourselves because we have a God that has loved us to the point that he was willing to unlove himself to do it. In just a few moments, we're going to enter into our time that we call the Lord's Supper. This is a time where we as a church remember what Jesus has done for us. We remember the way that he sacrificed for us. And what I would encourage you to do this morning, as the, as the ushers come and bring the trays, you'll have a tray passed down your aisle with little pieces of bread in it. Take one of those pieces of bread and eat it. And this is a chance for you to remember the life that Jesus gave, where he unloved himself for you, to sacrifice himself for you and love you. And when the other tray comes by, there will be a little cup of juice. Take one and drink it. Put the empty cup in the tray and pass it along. And when you do that, just think about this blood, this precious blood that he spilled. In the dirt that day, soldiers walking through it, dirt mixing in with it, wood soaking it up, was the blood... God Almighty, saying to you, I love you this much. And I just encourage you to think about that as you take that cup and drink it this morning. And then I'd like to encourage you as you're waiting for everybody else to take it, in silent prayer, just ask God, God, will you help me to have your heart of selflessness? Will you help me to learn to unlove myself the way that you do? Let's pray. Lord, we praise you this morning for all the things that you've done. And Lord, I know that we could never fathom just how amazing, just how much of a sacrifice it was for you to do what you did. We can never reciprocate it, which is why it's called grace when you give it. We can never give back to you out of what you've given to us. And God, right now as we think about how selfless you are, I pray that you will help us to, to evaluate, to examine our own hearts, and to ask you to help us to become less selfish. To become people who selflessly pursue you. And I just pray you'll bless this time and meet us here. It's in Christ's name we all say. Amen. We're going to enter into our time
time now where we receive the offering. This is something that uh, we do because we love the Lord. We do this out of our worship every Sunday at the end of our service. We receive an offering as part of our worship. We give to God. Uh, our church is fully funded by the giving of our regular attenders and our members. And I just want to remind you that your giving matters. When you give, we're able to do the kind of ministry we're able to do. I just went out and I told you I bought like 100 pounds of meat for our big day, right? And, and as you can imagine, 100 pounds of meat, that doesn't just, you know, happen. It's because we give in order to be able to be a church that reaches out and says to our community, hey, come in, we want to bless you, you know, and, and all the fun stuff that we're doing this summer, uh, Bomb Pop Sunday and, and all that. Which, by the way, does anybody remind me what next week is? Next week is Safari Sunday, so uh, that, that you, you might wonder what do I do with that. Uh, so next week, wear some khaki stuff, you know, look like you're on Safari, if you have pith helmets, you know, or is that the right, right, right word for those? You know, get those, maybe I'll try to find uh, some, some stuff. But we're going to do Safari Sunday, the reason we're doing that is because the Lion King comes out, and uh, I want to give away two tickets to the new Lion King movie next week, so be sure to come and, and wear your fifth helmets and, 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 and safari stuff, and we'll just have some fun with that. Uh, I'm sorry, I got us sidetracked from what we're supposed to be doing, but uh, I do want to just encourage you, your giving matters. It's part of what allows us to do the work that we do here at the church. And, uh, I also want to say to those of you who are guests, this is the time where you put in your connection cards, and we want to give something to you. So you're our guest today, and we have these books on the back table that says Welcome Guests. These are books called Unshakable, How to Stand Strong When Things Go Wrong. We'd like to give one of these to you. This book is a, a, might be a blessing to you, might help you in some way in your life. So in exchange for your complete connection card, uh, we'd like to give you one of these books. And so be sure to grab one on your way out. Nobody's going to corner you and attack you or talk to you or anything. You can just walk by and whoop, take it and go. And so uh, it, it's, it's our gift to you. And, and just please enjoy that. So with that said, let's pray. And then, uh, and then we'll, 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 we'll receive the offering. God, I just pray that you will bless what we do now. God, we know that that you uh, can take what we give and turn it into amazing ministry. I think of the times where you took fish and loaves and fed thousands. And God, sometimes uh, we know that, that what we give to you is, is small in comparison to the need of our community, in comparison to what it takes to do the work. But God, I pray that you will take every little bit we give this morning, that it would turn into something great in this community. Continue, God, to do work through this church and reaching this community with the truth of your word. God, I just pray that you will bless what we give now and make it matter even more than what we realize. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated while we give, and uh, after that, I'll come right back. 